Welcome to the Fretboard Journal Podcast. I am your host, Jason Verlindi, the founder, editor, and publisher of the Fretboard Journal magazine. I was just reminded by LinkedIn that I started the Fretboard Journal 18 years ago. Basically, I was trying to create a guitar magazine that I actually wanted to read that met my interests, that featured the artists and the builders and the collectors that I wanted to hear about. And we've been at it ever since. And we now do a whole family of podcasts. If you haven't checked out some of the other shows we do, you should. And we are about to put out our 53rd issue of the magazine. Ben Harper is going to be on the cover of that one. If you want to subscribe and haven't yet, go to fretboardjournal.com. Click on that subscribe button. I will make sure you get a copy the minute they fly off of the press. So today on the show, I am talking to someone who has been featured in the Fretboard Journal many, many times, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, most legendary guitar dealer of all time, George Groon. George has a new line of instruments, the Versitar line of instruments that he designed, and he didn't just do the thing where he comes up with a cool design and he finds some overseas factory to build them for him. He's built and staffed a factory in Lebanon, Tennessee, not far from Nashville, from scratch, and is designing and building these guitars entirely in the United States. They're coming in at the two to $3,000 range. George is no stranger to designing guitars. As you will hear, he designed guitars for Tacoma way back in the day, and these bear a resemblance to those guitars, but there are some important differences George talks all about it. It's a great chat. I have been trying to get this interview for months, ever since George first announced these guitars. The prototypes were kicking around. George didn't want to do it until the finished guitars were ready. They are ready, and they are flying off the shelves at Groon Guitars in Nashville, and it sounds like they might even be showing up at stores near you at some point in the near future. Our podcast is brought to you by our friends at Stringjoy Strings, you can get 10% off of your first order of Stringjoy Strings by using the discount code FRIPBOARD. We are also brought to you by our friends at Peghead Nation. They have around 30 of the greatest guitar and mandolin and banjo instructors around, including folks like Danny Barnes and Matt Munisteri and Tia Gherkin and Joe K. Walsh and various other friends of the Fretboard Journal. You can get your first month free or $20 off of your annual subscription by using the discount code FRETBOARD. We're also brought to you by Isotope. Use the discount code FRET10 to save 10% off of Isotope and their software. And last but not least, Vintage Guitar Heroes, Mike and Mike's Guitar Bar, are sponsoring the show. Right now, they have a 54 Blackguard weighing in at 7 pounds, 6 ounces. It's been refinned, so it's a little cheaper than it would be if it was mint. They also have a 60 Sunburst Strat, a 61 Olympic White Strat, and so much more. A 52 Les Paul Max conversion into a burst. This is one of the coolest stores around and it's in the Fretboard Journal's backyard. Go to MM Guitar Bar to learn more. Again, our guest today is George Groon of Groon Guitars. I'm personally hoping to get George to one of our next Fretboard Summits in Chicago and the next one is going to be August 22nd to 24th. Before we talk about the new line of guitars, let's hear a little bit about how your store is doing. I mean, obviously, you, you moved from the famous Broadway location many years ago. Uh, have you filled all the walls? Is it Have you overfilled it? Well, we moved from a 12,000 square foot building to an 18,000 square foot building. Now, that might lead some people to think that it would look a little sparse at first, but the fact is the old building was almost like pressurized gas. And, you know, when you release it into a bigger room, it immediately fills it. And uh, it, it uh, we had enough that I wish we had a bigger building. What I really had wanted was a double to space. I, I really wanted 25,000, but we just couldn't find the right one. The only one we found that was about 25 needed over $3 million of restoration work to make it work, and it would have busted the budget. Um, so what we have is working pretty well, uh, but it certainly didn't have room to set up guitar building. It has room upstairs to do guitar repair which we do indeed have, and our third floor is devoted entirely to repair. Uh, the first floor is entirely show area uh, with one small office, my sales manager, 
but it's and um, it's also several tryout rooms. But um, second floor is we have three floors of equal size. The second floor has offices and it has storage space because all those instruments have cases. And since we don't have a fourth dimensional hole to shove the cases into where they're out of sight and take up no floor space, we unfortunately have to have an area for case storage and cases are bigger than the guitars. And uh, But we have a pretty efficient storage area. And we do have a smaller showroom on the second floor where we have boutique pieces, uh, custom order, primarily custom order Martins that are made to my specs. So it's not like they're onesies and twosies. They're things we order in large quantity. We just got a full pallet load of them in today from Martin. And it's frequent enough that we get one or even two total pallet loads of Martins per week. So it's not UPS pulling up with one or two boxes. It's big truck with a lift and pallet. And we get lots of Martins, many of which are made to my specs, featuring sinker mahogany, Adirondack spruce, and just specs that are not catalog standard, but are in effect room standards. Um, but now the new venture is my own factory in Lebanon, Tennessee, which is about 35 miles from the shop. Uh, we still continue to do everything that the shop has done as a retail outlet. So we have new Martin, Taylor, Fender. Uh, we have Beard Guitars. We're one of his bigger dealers. And uh, you know, we have a few others, like a few Loudons. And uh, we have uh, just a variety of new guitars. Uh, but... McPherson also, we sell a moderate number of those. But in fact, some people look at this and say, well, that's like a McPherson. And he says, no, it's not. <laughs> McPherson has a hole here, not here. <laughs> and the, the bracing and construction and sound are completely different. The neck design is totally different. Structurally, these have really no resemblance to McPherson other than that they don't have a round hole here. Sure. There's nothing else that's similar. They got six strings or a guitar, but uh, the only thing that resembles this at all are the Tacoma guitars that were made back in the 1990s. And I designed those and they gave me a royalty on those. So these are an evolutionary step beyond the Tacomas. But um, it's been an interesting experience to get into that. Um, and some people might wonder why at age 78, I'm starting a new venture. Yes, that was one of my questions. Is that I'm still working six days a week. I have no interest whatever in retirement as long as I am physically able and mentally able and have a good staff that backs me up, then I want to have fun. And fun means design new items, do things that are meaningful. And I did this because I feel that while the world does not need more clones of Martin, Fender, or Gibson, there is a space for something that's new. But it needs to have a reason to exist. If you want the Martin sound, you can get one. They make good ones. And if you don't like everything exactly as it is in the catalog, they got a custom shop. And Or if you can take a look at the ones that I offer that are grown specials, they're not the catalog standard. Martin doesn't have anything in the catalog with sinker mahogany. It's been underwater for one to 200 years and is virgin forest old wood from Belize. When you couple that with the pre-World War II style bracing, 
and Adirondack spruce that is non torrified not oven baked. It produces an amazing result, but it still is an amazing Martin sound, whereas there is a space out there for something different. And these are specifically designed to go where nobody else's current guitar goes, or like the Star Trek motto, to go where no man has gone before. <laughs> well, to go back to those early Tacoma designs, and to, you're right, McPherson, because of the sound hole shape loosely, and Tacoma, everybody, the folks who are talking about these guitars already have referenced both those. You designed and got a, a, a royalty for those early Tacoma guitars. Were you happy with how those turned out or were concessions made out of the gate where you were like, this isn't really what I wanted? The Tacomas, at least the plain, unornamented model was actually quite good. Mm -hmm. The ones they made that had more ornamentation and fancy woods mm -hmm. and gloss finishes left a great deal to be desired. The finishes were a thick polyurethane. And it turned out that they really didn't prep the wood properly, so that they ended up with a great deal of warranty problem with peeling finishes, uh, which is one reason why they're not around anymore. But Another reason why Tacoma is not around anymore was that it was a division of Yongchang, a Korean company, and it was originally designed as a facility that could make OEM, original equipment manufacturing, in other words, for other brand names, just like the factory did in Korea. They could make dozens of different brand names, so they thought they could do something like that in the USA. and. I convinced their management that it would be better if they had something of their own. But shortly after that, there was a Korean currency crisis, which uh, caused a deep recession in Korea. They got a government bailout, and it required that they divest themselves of all their U.S. holdings, which was, among others, Tacoma. So they sold it to a relative of the chairman of Yongchang who didn't do a good job in management. They didn't have the right management in place, manufacturing or simply oversight. Um, it still worked out that the Tacoma very plain model with just a hand rubbed oil finish, very thin, tended to sound very good and play quite well but we have certainly added tweaks to it. And it looks a bit different too. Changed the peghead shape. The sound hole shape is not the same. It's instead of the paisley shape, it's a more teardrop. The bridge design is completely different and the bracing is not identical. And the workmanship out of my factory is vastly superior, but particularly if we do a gloss finish, which most of them are a matte finish, but we can do a matte finish that's very thin and acoustically very, very good. We know how to prep the wood. Uh, my plant manager, Jay Meyer, was a Martin employee for 20 plus years. He worked there in wood buying, equipment buying, and trained in almost every step of production. So we have not only a good plant manager, but we have employees who have experience making good guitars and our finishing people are really good on finish. They have worked elsewhere. They know how to spray finishes of very high quality. We have a absolute top of the line compressor that guarantees that there's no water in the finish and that we can spray finishes as thin as three thousandths of an inch th thick, so thinner even than the diameter of any guitar string anybody uses. The thinnest guitar strings I know, Billy Gibbons uses a seven string on 
the first E, but our finishes are three. There are three mils. So um, when we do a gloss finish, it's a bit more, but on the matte finishes, we can do it that thin. And it is protective for the wood. I'm not going to claim it's totally scratch proof, but it gives you a terrific sound. And uh, it's sufficiently durable. The, uh, but we're not compromising sound. These guitars are definitely an evolutionary step beyond anything I've ever done before. And they are clearly not a clone of any guitar that is on the market today. And I do have one of the absolute top musical instrument patent and trademark attorneys working on protecting it. Good. What is the timeline for this project? I mean, you and I have been emailing about this for months and you went through some prototypes and then you finally got the finished guitar. But going back even further, what's the timeline of you deciding to bring these guitars to market and then deciding to start your own factory, which is such an incredible feat these days? Well, it's not a huge factory. It is 7,000 square feet. But right now we have a dozen people and we are well tooled up so that uh, at the moment we're turning out about on average 1.5 guitars a day. Uh, we don't turn out any, we don't release half guitars, but uh, we make on average about 1.5 guitars a day and we are rapidly progressing to do two per day and hopefully it won't be very long before we're doing three per day. Uh, but I do wish to get up to 20 per week in the not terribly distant future, like the coming year. But, um, and while we have one basic model right now, which I call the Versitar, the E R I or V E R. S I T A R V E R S I T A, a versatar, versatile guitar. And uh, I went through a lot of possibilities for names, uh, but uh, I guess we would have to say that. Uh, but my title for the company is, aside from the fact I own it, uh, I guess we would say I'm the guitar architect. Uh huh. And uh, yeah. Buildings are built by architects, but maybe guitars are designed by guitar architects. But uh, at any rate, I have been very much behind the design on these instruments. But I have very good people on staff who certainly make some suggestions on exactly how to accomplish some of these goals. So... The exact shaping of the bracing and placement of the bracing has been a joint effort uh, and has involved some experimentation. But I feel like we've really got something quite special. Uh, we had last year thought that we could do it with Gallagher in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and I do have uh, a couple of prototypes. And this one right here is actually the very first prototype that was built before I had a factory. And some of the videos are out uh, with Tommy Emanuel and Steve Earle and um, Brad Paisley are actually playing this one. Okay. It has no logo, no label, no serial number, but this was hand-built by Jay Meyer when he was at Gallagher. And um, unfortunately, Gallagher wasn't really able to do the quantity or the quality control or the price that we really wanted. And I finally have decided my experience, I've designed guitars with Guild. They bankrupted. 
Um, I was on their board of directors. I told the board they were on a path that would bankrupt the company within a few months. They fired me and then they bankrupted in three months. <laughs> but being correct and being happy is not always the same. Sure. So this time I finally just decided that it has been a lifelong ambition for me to be able to have guitars made to my specs in a facility that I can control and where I can have ultimate power to change specs, to control quality, and to basically be responsible for good or bad. But, uh, it's something I've always wanted to do. So I finally decided that most people wouldn't do it at age 78, but I wouldn't be alone in starting a new company at that age. Plus, I do have a succession plan. You do? Stepson, Eric, is the company president and general manager at Gruen Guitars. And if anything does happen to me such that I am either no longer here or unable, the company can go on. But I may be old enough that some people may view me as a senior citizen, but I don't want to actually start acting old. I don't feel decrepit. I'm not too old to have fun. I'm actually having more fun now than at almost any other time in my life. I wish that my wife who had Alzheimer's would be having as much fun as me, but I'm still here and she's at home with a caregiver. But I'm not decrepit. And my great uncle Otto lived to be 105. He didn't retire. His sister Emma only made it to 102. But Emma was still reading the Wall Street Journal every day when she was 100 years old because it was relevant to her. She was following her investments and actively participating. And she did very well. Even Otto did well. But Otto died in the mid 70s, 1970s, at age 105. But uh, back in the depth of the Great Depression, he put all of his money in the stock market. And according to my father, he put it in Ford Chrysler, General Motors, AT&T, and General Electric, saying that if they went under, it wouldn't matter about his money because his money would be worthless and the country would be almost ungovernable, and our, our currency would be of no use. And he did well. He made $5 million during the Depression. Real money. That was in the days when a new Martin Herringbone D28 was $100, and a B45 was $200, and Otto made $5 million. Well, frankly, I haven't done as well in my career, perhaps as Otto did with just stock manipulation, or he didn't manipulate it, he just bought it. He didn't manipulate the stock market, but he did understand enough to do that. For me, this is not really about money. It's about passion. I like guitars, but I feel that there's a gaping hole in the market there aren't any acoustic guitars that you can play rock and roll on and play virtually the same arrangements as on electric guitar, but pull it off acoustically and get a tone that is still distinctly acoustic and not simply the sound of a pickup. These guitars can do traditional funky blues. You can play bluegrass lead. You can play Django Reinhardt style jazz. You can do modern jazz. You can do, that's why I'm calling it the versatile. 
it is a very versatile instrument, uh, more so than my personal playing can demonstrate. But uh, when Tommy Emmanuel plays it and says it's the best Django guitar he's ever played, but then he can also do Chet style and Travis style on it, that's something special. It also can play bluegrass lead about as loud as a mandolin, because one of the weak links in an acoustic bluegrass band is the guitar can play rhythm, but when it plays lead, unless you have a pickup on it or a microphone three inches from it, you can't hear it in an acoustic room with no amplification of any kind. You can hear the mandolin, the banjo, the fiddle, the bass, and a dobro plenty loud. But when the guitar player takes a lead break, you can you struggle to hear it at all, although it can work on stage amplified. But the point is, if these are loud enough, you can play acoustic lead and they cut. But you can play it soft and pretty too. So you can play, they're far louder than it seems because with the sound hole where it is, you can do uh, something quite different. Standard guitar with sound hole here has to have a bridge there and there and X here and two up, two up, two down and a bridge plate and braces and a bridge plate. With sound hole here, not only do you have a nice convenient handle, <laughs> yeah, but Ibanez, it balances pretty well there. Um, but with a bass bar and a treble bar and bridge plate, and that's it. It's almost more like an old arch top. Much like an arch top. Five mandolin, which is also a carved top. But mm -hmm. It's also a five up here, which on a flat top guitar it isn't. And on a typical guitar, light gauge strings, gauge first, you got about 165 pounds of string tension. Mm -hmm. It pulls the neck forward, even if you have a nice straight neck, it pulls the neck forward, caves the top in a bit here. And if it does it even a few millimeters, you end up with your actions bad. Yeah. And it pulls the top this way. So it caves in in front of the bridge and bellies up behind the bridge. And the bracing on it is the lateral strength is pretty good with standard bracing. But the longitudinal strength, it doesn't prevent it from caving up. So it's doing that and that. And then you put a big round hole right where it's trying to collapse its sway. Not only that, you, know, you don't need a sound port to hear yourself. This puts it where it projects very well out front, but you can also hear yourself extremely well, almost like a sound port. The neck is a bolt-on, and it's not screw-on like a fender. A fender has wood screws, four wood screws. And if you take the neck off and then screw it in again, those wood screws chew at that hole. And it doesn't take very long at all that the holes in the neck are no longer going to grip the screw very well, so the neck isn't tight anymore. These are furniture bolts, not much different from an IKEA furniture piece. They go into wood fixtures, threaded metal fixtures in the neck. So you can take that neck in and out a hundred times without stripping it. It's a good solid joint. And on a standard guitar, there's a neck heel that gets in the way a little bit when you're doing reaching up. Besides from that, on a neck heel, the truss rod is anchored in the neck heel, so effectively it can only work from about the 12th fret to the nut. This has 22 frets, they're all reachable, and they all sound good. But the truss rod runs the full length, just like it would on a Fender guitar. And the fingerboard is glued to neck the entire way. So many people may think of a bolt-on neck as being somehow a cheap feature. It works yeah. not very well on a Fender. It also works very well on this. These upper notes, even at the 22nd fret, ring and sing so that you have usable 
notes. So you have to, on most flat top cutaways, people don't use those notes much because the action is not very adjustable there. It, the truss rod really works from there to there and not from here to here, but also a tonality over the body really changes noticeably. Whereas here, it's pretty much uniform type response so far as volume, harmonic complexity, sustain, it works all up and down. Mm -hmm. So it's designed to do something different. We're doing also some different woods. Um, base model is generally mahogany, sapele, um, but or black locust. This was black locust, mostly known as a great wood for firewood or yeah. fence. Yeah, not talked about in guitars much. If you pick up, I haven't heard anybody talk about it for guitars. <laughs> yeah. but, but if you pick up a piece of this, board of it, hold it, hit it with a mallet, it rings almost like a xylophone bar. It's very dense. It's hard. It's strong. It's stable. It sounds good. And it actually looks good. So we are using that as one of our standard woods. But in addition, we have ash and black walnut and Osage orange. We have Indian rosewood. We have we have Nicaraguan rosewood. We have cocobolo. Uh, we've got some Brazilian rosewood. We have a variety of woods. Uh, this one has a white holly bridge. It's as white as ivory. That is the natural color of the wood. Um, these are Indian rosewood. This is a red cedar top. This is an Adirondack spruce top. That's another cedar top. And uh, this one prototype is a mahogany back and sides. Uh, but we are doing some with more ornamentation. Uh, we are able to offer abalone top trim. Um, instead of the peg head decal, we are able to do it in pearl and abalone. And we have some of that in progress. Uh, in addition to just dots on the board, we are doing some with larger, fancier inlay, uh, big slotted diamonds that uh, look quite good. Um, but I had a limited number here because they are selling about as fast as we can make them. This is what I, this is some of what I have on hand today. Um, I should have five or six more tomorrow and the next day. So uh, in two days, I sh I'll get somewhere between five and six over the next two days that are coming in. But um I also don't have a big shipping problem from the factory to here because Jay Meyer lives about less than five minute drive from where I do. And so he just can bring the day's production to his house and I can pick it up early in the morning. Incredible. Incredible. What's the story with the Grun logo at the headstock, the, the doodle? That's Freddie Beastie. Um, I could draw you a Freddie. But um, Freddie and his friends, there are numerous Freddie friends, uh, started visiting me. I had his baby pictures from about 1963, and uh, I could see them. I could talk to them. They'd talk back to me. I'd hear them. They'd pose, but they wouldn't show up on film. The camera didn't work on them. Mirror didn't even work on them. I saw them. I heard them. Pot was 125 a kilo back then, but I don't do that anymore either. Uh, I found that that's very incompatible with attempting to do business these days, so I don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I still know how it felt, and I still can see. I, I still, Freddie and his friends can visit me with no extra enhancement needed. I can still see him and draw him and his friends very effectively. 
And on this one, you know, on the standard shop logo, Freddie's playing a standard round hole guitar. But the logo on these, he's playing one of these. I love so, it. So Freddie's versatile. He can do lots of things. He can play banjo and mandolin too, but he didn't even start to play guitar until 69. It's so cool. You've you've been in this industry for so long. You know everyone. Uh, aside from talking to Gallagher, between Tacoma finally nailing the coffin and today, were you trying to talk to your friends at Martin or Callings or any of their brands and champion this kind of unique design of guitar that you've come up with? Martin is pretty set in what they want to do. Sure. And I don't much blame them for that. When they are struggling to keep up with demand, they don't need to get out into something that is a totally different animal. Mm -hmm. Ayler has Andy Powers designing guitars and says that they pretty much have their schedule for the next five years of everything that they are going to do. Um, they are not interested in getting designs from outside. Uh, and at this point, Taylor is making more guitars than just as far as the quantity, number of guitars. They are the, making more guitars than any other maker in the USA today, doing it domestic in-house in their own factory. Plus, they have a big factory in Mexico. Uh, it's very interesting to tour the Taylor factory. They are incredibly well organized. They have a machine shop that is as big as my building and bigger than my factory, just as a machine shop to service what they do. Mm -hmm. um, so I, they're not interested in doing something for somebody else of that nature. Uh, so the major makers, Martin, Fender, Gibson, uh, would not really be interested. And I don't fault them for that. They're busy doing their own thing. And this is clearly a very different design. I'm not saying that they couldn't make something like this, but they have not chosen to do so. And they've been very successful at what they do. I don't knock Fender, Martin, Gibson, or any of the others. I'm interested in doing something that fits in a market space where they are not. And if all I could do would be to try to make a better version of a Martin or Gibson style guitar, I don't feel that that would be a very worthy goal. Um, I don't feel that I can, I don't see any reason to compete with them on their own turf. They're doing a very good job and their guitars are just fine, but these do different things. And for those who want to hear the different things, it's better to listen to some of the videos posted uh, and there'll be more recordings soon, but uh, I can't demonstrate this the way Brad Paisley and skill or Tommy Emanuel have done. Uh, most of the players who've bought them so far have been professional musicians who buy them because even if you already own 100 guitars, you don't have one that's like this. It's not simply a matter of a different ornamentation. They do look different, but they also sound different. And if they didn't sound and feel different, there would be no reason to do it. But my goal was to make a new design guitar that would be not only visually distinctive enough that you could tell it from 100 feet away at a glance, but it is sonically different enough in sound that blindfolded, you can pick it out from any other brand guitar that it does things that they don't do. And that is not to say that they don't do what they do well. They do. But this does. You can do a lot of the traditional sounds very well on this, but it does have tone. 
and the ability to do some types of music that you would normally never even dream of doing on an acoustic guitar that you do only on an electric, but this can pull it off and do its own sound where it simply doesn't sound just like a Les Paul plugged in, but acoustically as its own sound, but it goes in the same, you can do the same stuff that you would do on an electric, but it comes up with new tones that electrics don't quite do. So it is an interesting new sound. It's as sound in its own way as say, an F5 mandolin is. When the Lloyd Lore signed F5 mandolin came out, it had tones in it that no previous mandolin had ever done, even though it was tuned the same and played essentially the same. You could do things on it that you couldn't do on any other mandolin. And when Bill Monroe got a hold of an F5, he invented bluegrass. Before that, he didn't play bluegrass. The Monroe brothers didn't play bluegrass. Monroe's sound changed when he got an instrument that would do new things. And for that matter, folks like Charlie Christian, when he got a hold of an ES-150 Gibson, started to play things you couldn't do acoustically. Yeah, but this can do acoustically the stuff he was doing electrically. But it has a different sound from an electric. And has a different sound from attempting to do the same stuff on a Martin. It has its own sound, but it's a good sound. It works. Did did you did this surprise you, or was this the result of a lot of trial and error? Because I think back to those old Tacoma instruments, and th those were great. Some of those, as you said, were great guitars, and they did have their own voice. But I wouldn't say they were necessarily revolutionary in, in what they offered. And they certainly weren't a hybrid between electric and acoustic, really. Very clear idea of what I was aiming for. I knew what I wanted. And I feel that we are doing quite a good job of doing it. And uh, the different types of wood do produce different tone. Index spruce sounds different from Sitka, which sounds different from Western Red Cedar. And mahogany versus... The black wall, the black, well, black wall, not or black locust. Uh, we also have some koa wood. Um, Indian rosewood is different sounding from the Nicaraguan rosewood, but they're all good and there are distinctly different tones. But we have basically one basic design here with lots of variation in wood and lots of flexibility on ornamentation. And so right now I don't have any of the fancy ones like with the abalone trim here, uh, but the Nicaraguan rosewood and the fancy abalone trim model both sold this first day they were put out. They sold immediately. Mm -hmm. Have more coming. Uh, we have the ability to be extremely versatile. And uh, as far as custom options, we have... And we're not trying to make a bunch of different models in terms of basic design. We're not interested in trying to make you a dreadnought size guitar similar to a Martin. If you want that, get a Martin. They're good. And I don't feel that we can easily make a better Martin style guitar than Martin does. We're trying to do something that's different, but has a reason to exist. And the result so far is very good. And the quality control is quite meticulous. And the ability to ramp up production is not only there, but it's essential because I do want to see this puppy grow up into adolescence. Uh, I have, you know, I may be 78, but people may think that oh, you can't work much longer, but there's plenty of people who work to 90 or beyond. And um, I can't guarantee how much longer I'm going to live or be productive, but I can guarantee that as long as I'm mentally and physically able, I'm going to be at this. And I'm not about to give up on life in general or pursuing my passion as long as I have that passion 
and I'm physically and mentally able, I'm going to do it. I'm not interested in saving a bunch of money for retirement. And what money I did have saved that my wife had socked away for retirement went into the factory. Okay. Um, but I'm happy to have done that. I'm not drawing a salary at this time. And if I had simply wanted just simply to cash in and make more money, I'm sure I could have found something else. It would have been easier. But this is something I have always wanted to do. And over the years, my efforts working with manufacturers such as Guild and Tacoma turned out to be a lot of fun at the beginning designing, but no fun when the companies ran into trouble and none of them ran into trouble because of any of my designs. It was management problems, financial problems, but it was generally the models I didn't design that they had problems with, or in some cases, such as Tacoma doing the poly finishes, I never asked them to do that, and I didn't like those. Sure. You're going to, you're hoping to make 20 guitars a week. That's a pretty bold number for a boutique guitar company. That's pretty good. Are they all going to well, be sold exclusively? And used to be boutique guitars. Uh, I wanted to do a guitar for under $3,000 that would outcompete the sound of a lot of those so-called boutique guitars. Most of the boutique guitars do not have a sound that is so distinctive that when you pick it up, you can immediately, eyes closed, tell what brand it is. They have generic guitar sounds. These don't, these don't sound generic. They're different. But in something like this with rosewood, cedar, LR bags, hi-fi pickup, heavy-duty gator gig bag, $2,700. That's not a boutique price. No. But so far as sound... There's not much, some of those $30,000 boutique guitars, in my opinion, are good for display rather than play. If you want one to display in a glass case and brag about how much you spent, there are some that do a great job of that. And some of those actually do sound very good. And quite frankly, some don't. But most of them do not have a sound that is particularly distinctive, such that with your eyes closed, you could have a pretty good idea who made that. These, blindfolded, you can pick them out. They are a different sound. They do things that standard design guitars do not do. But it was the goal to make it affordable for professional players or side men, not just for the big star. Sure. But the big stars still buy them. Keith Urban did buy one just by this one. Same Bex. My question before I, I didn't mean to slight you by calling you a boutique guitar company, but my question was that's a pretty good quantity of guitars. Are they all, is your plan to eventually have these in other stores, or is Groon always going to be the hub where? You have to buy these. Currently, we are the only source. Okay. Always is a long time. And uh, I fully expect that in the near future, we will set up some, not many, but some dealers. Okay. Uh, because for one thing, seeing things online is not the same as being able to go in somewhere, pick it up and play it. Mm -hmm. But um, we are not planning to have a network of hundreds of dealers. But I absolutely am not ruling out the possibility that soon there may be some dealers that we will set up with these. But right now, uh, I'm having enough trouble keeping up with the demand here. Mm -hmm. uh, but 
there are dealers that I know have an excellent reputation, not only for demonstrating, displaying them and spreading the word, but also for being financially sound and paying their bills on time. Sure. Those are important things to have. Yeah. Uh, but um, so, yeah, if we're making 20 a week, uh, and it may not be long before we're doing that, but I, I think in the relatively near future that we will have some dealer to represent these guitars in addition to Grimm guitars, and they will cost the same as getting it from me. But, What's your secret? To, made in America at that price point, um, there aren't a lot of options, especially on the smaller scale guitar makers. I, uh, Lebanon, I'm imagining, is is not like being in San Diego or Austin, Texas, so it's probably a, a cheaper cost of living. But have you made concessions? Is it is it that you're less worried about the finish as long as it's nitro and more worried about the sound? Or how are you our, doing this? Our compressor cost over $10,000. So, yeah, we're concerned about having a good quality. <laughs> okay. In other words, we have a absolutely top-of-the-line spray setup. So we're not doing funky finish. We're okay. doing a thin matte finish on most but it's a very high quality finish and it is nitro. Um, but a thick gloss finish does dampen sound. To get the sound we want, it actually requires a thin finish to, re to bring out the fullest acoustic response. And I, even though we offer the pickup options and they sound great plugged in, I want them to sound great plugged in and great acoustically. So we're offering the pickup as an option, and uh, we are making at least a third of them do have pickups in them. And if somebody wants a pickup, the pickup option adds $150 to the retail price. But it's uh, we're using currently the LR Bags Hi-Fi pickup, and there's the ability to put in almost any kind of this, you see that this uh, small hole, let me get my hand in here very far, but mm. we got an access panel for a little Allen wrench screws, two millimeter. Getting to the whole thing. You can change the battery, you can put what pretty much any kind of pickup you want, you can get your arm in here and stick your fingers out the sound hole. So if it ever needs any maintenance, we were concerned about the ability to have a guitar that is easy maintenance. And if you don't like one neck shape, you can offer multiple neck shapes. It takes about five minutes to take one neck off and put another neck on. You want a soft V? Want a harder V, you want a C shape and contour, we can do those. So we have the ability to do different neck contours. We have the ability that everything on this guitar is very serviceable. You know, with proper care, a guitar can last a long time. I have Martin guitars going as far back as 1836 that are still very playable and they've had some maintenance over the years. But I do have some guitars as far back as 1902 that have had no maintenance other than reglue a bridge and that look virtually new. And with proper care, there's no reason why this can't last equally long. It's an instrument, guitars in general, last longer than people do. People come in, who may be my age, they have a picture of the, the, they have a guitar, they bring a photo taken, mommy and daddy bought it for them when they were 10 years old, they have a photo of it. They're unrecognizable. 10 year old, <laughs> it's hard to extrapolate what he looks now at 80, but... Sure. <laughs> the guitar looks just the same as it did in the photo. 
And Stradivari died in 1737 at age 94. And there's still about 650 well-documented Stradivari violins in existence today. Now, they've had maintenance, and they've been hot-rotted, too, to have a longer-scale neck. But uh, they still function, and they're yeah. still Stradivaris or Guarneris or other, uh, even uh, violins from the 1500s. Uh, the Salo, McKinney, and some of the early uh, Mahdi family instruments, some of those from the mid-1500s are still playable, but they've had maintenance. When this is designed to be very responsive. It is lightweight, but it is also designed to be strong, and it is designed to be serviceable. Each instrument we make or that anybody else makes is sort of an ambassador for the brand. And if you make a good one, it may be a good one for the next 150 years or more. If you make a bad one, it's also capable of making bad impressions on people for more than a century later. It behooves a maker to make good ones. And if you get a bad bottle of wine, well, you open it up and it turns to vinegar. You dump it down the drain, uh, but it doesn't stay to haunt everybody. But the thing is also about guitars is you can use them for their intended purpose, and they don't all of a sudden degrade a car. Every mile you drive it, it's worth less. But guitars over time often go up. And the pleasure that you get from it, the more you use it, the more it opens up, although a lot of that opening up is in the first week. But they do sound good when they're brand new on first day. You don't have to wait 10 years for it to sound good. But they do open up dramatically in the first week of playing, and they gradually a bit more afterward. Uh, but they are good from day one. They're fun to play from day one. And unlike other products, like an expensive bottle of wine, you drink it and you have a sensation in your mouth for a second or two, maybe three, if you savor it. But once you drink it, it's gone. And if you consume it and use it for its intended purpose, two hours later, you pee. And there's nothing left of the wine that's usable for anything. Serve a really fine dinner with it. Invite friends over because you had a $40,000 bottle of wine. And you don't want to drink that just alone. You invite friends and you have a very expensive dinner spread. Well, the sensation of eating and drinking doesn't last long. Two hours later, you pee and in the morning you poop. These you can use for their intended purpose and they don't turn to pee or poop yeah they last that's true of guitars in general guitars are fun i like guitars and they have soul and personality and that's why people often collect and have so many of them but even if you have 50 or 100 guitars i can pretty much assure you that you don't have one that sounds like these and these still do sounds that virtually no other guitars I have ever played can truly do the same. They are really distinctive, but it's not only distinctive, it's good distinctive. It's usable. It gives you new ideas. And I can say that while my personal lifetime earnings playing guitar from 63 to the present, being paid to play, I have made a grand total of $49 on eight occasions that collectively add up to that. So that's something close to 82 cents a year on average. But since getting these, my personal playing has dramatically improved. People have actually commented listening to me play on these. George, you're playing better than you ever did. And I find them more inspiring. My playing technique has changed. 
And I am enjoying playing these things to the point where they are, at this time, the primary guitars I am personally playing. Wow. Some extremely good and very valuable guitars in my personal collection. But I'm playing these more than any of them right now. But I still can say that I'm very pleased with the new Martin guitars that I'm getting that are specially made to our specs. They are wonderful instruments. They have a distinctly different sound from this, and they're really, really good for that. Uh, Fender Custom Shop, we're doing quite well with those, and they are good. And there are a bunch of makers right now that are making good quality guitars. The quality of guitars from the major companies, Martin, Fender, Gibson, is the best they've made in the last 50 years, easily. But of course, 50 years ago, 1973, that was not exactly a golden era of guitar building. So in one way, I'm saying that the ones they make now are better than the worst they ever made. But actually, the ones they're making right now are approaching the golden era of their making. They're, they're making some remarkably good new guitars at almost all of the major manufacturers, Martin, Fender, Gibson. And they're doing well, and Taylor didn't have a golden era in the past, but the new Taylors are the best that they've ever made. And Andy Powers, their main designer, is a brilliant designer and very talented. So this is perhaps in some ways another golden era of guitar manufacturing in quantity, producing high quality guitars in a greater quantity than high quality guitars had ever been made before. Do I think that the new Martins beat what they made in 1935 or six? No. But are they approaching it closer than they ever have before and still have some new ideas? Yes. Martin's not simply only blindly copying the 1936 model and trying to reproduce it. They have some new ideas too. And they do play physically very well. They intonate better. So the quality of new instruments overall is good. But these are special. And the only way you'll ever really know how special they are is to play one and hear it and feel it for yourself. Because listening to me play it over this microphone is not going to cut it. <laughs> At this point in production, have you touched and quality controlled every single one of these guitars or have a few sold without you looking at them? None have sold without me seeing them. Okay. So what is your absolute favorite wood combination of the many that you outlined? I'm hard put to come up with it, but... I can tell you the Nicaraguan rosewood with cedar was an amazing guitar. And I sort of was tempted to just keep it. But uh, there's more, there's three more of them in progress. Uh, I happen to really like all of them very well. I really like Sound of Black Locust. Yeah. Uh, and Adirondack versus cedar is tough choice. They are distinctly different voices, and it just depends what you're playing. Uh, but um, the one that I really do like, the Cedar Tops. But we've been quite successful with the Adirondack as well. And on a lot of them, we do sunburst on some, uh, some of the uh, Addy. But that, the Adirondack without stain is quite pale, but it does age. and get darker quickly and we can do on rosewood we do some with the sunburst top finish and uh, others you know we're able to do a full sunburst front back sides neck everywhere and it does cost a bit extra for sunburst versus natural but you know, we're quite the versatile is a versatile sounding guitar and groove manufacturing is versatile enough that we can do new designs 
And we do have plans in the very near future to introduce a baritone guitar. And it will be a powerhouse. And we know that from direct experimental results that we are going to produce a baritone guitar that has a long enough scale and a big enough body and the right string combination and bracing that it will be a powerful sounding instrument acoustically as well as just electrically. Most baritone guitars work okay with a pickup, but they really don't project and they're not as loud as a standard size, standard tuning guitar. But uh, we will be producing a baritone guitar. It will be every bit as loud and versatile acoustically as a standard size. And uh, the next one after that, uh, we will produce a smaller guitar tuned five frets over standard. So the baritone is five frets below standard. And we will have a smaller, shorter scale guitar, five frets above standard. But there's a limit to how many things I can do at once. Because I also have two different electric guitar designs in mind. I already have prototypes. Uh, but I can design things quicker than they can easily do all the tooling. And um, there's, there's a limit to, you have to control growth to the point where you don't overexert. Classic weed killer for dandelions is give them too much growth hormone. Uh, we have to control it to the point where the factory can keep up with it on a management and cost effective for tooling up. There's a limit to how many things you can tool up to do at once. Uh, it is an ambitious project. Yeah. Uh, I have every intention of pursuing this. Uh, We're having fun. I, I can I can see that and and I feel like you know in the last few years maybe it's these Zoom chats you're doing uh, with with the public but you, you seem to just be having more fun than you know I've known you now for eighteen twenty years the the life of the Fretboard Journal and and it's great to see your enthusiasm about this project I I also you know you're probably the one person who's been the most pragmatic. And and first to say, like, there are too many guitars in the universe. So for you to to take the chance and make the leap to, to start your own guitar factory, it's got to be a pretty special thing. I would, if all I could do is design something that's similar to a Martin, I wouldn't do it. Yeah. Because the world has enough of them. And Martin is doing a really good job. And but there's others that are sort of in that niche. You can see Preston Thompson, Bourgeois, and Collings, uh, Santa Cruz. But um, I don't want to compete with them because they're basically all in a similar enough market niche. And uh, that that particular type of design is very well covered. Um, everything from student model imports to high-end boutique. You know, there's dozens of makers doing that or even like, why would the world need another maker of clones of Telecaster, Stratocasters, Jaguar, Jazzmaster? Uh, not interested. I'm not saying that they're not good guitars, but um, you know, if the market can be sort of conceived as a big pie shape and 60% of the people want A, 20% want B, and then the remainder is cut into smaller and smaller. Well, you know, if there's a thousand competitors and they all want, 99% of them want to do A and B and ignore B, C, D, or not, not say it would be EF and G, whatever. Yeah. yeah. I go after the smaller. But uh, those people may sometimes be very, very good players. 
but they're also more loyal. If I'm the only one to make something like this, if you want this sound, this playability, there's nobody else doing this. You want that, it's different. But if you want basically a Martin type sound, you have the choice of Martin versus a variety of others or a Fender type sound. There's dozens of people making Fender clones. Um, and some of them are very good, but you know, as far as do they make an old Fender obsolete? No, they don't. Now, I don't claim this makes a Martin obsolete either. This is something new. It is a different sound, but you can have a lot of fun playing it, doing things that you would not even dream of trying on a Martin. And if you did try, it wouldn't work as well. <laughs> this does things they don't do, but I'm not claiming that it makes them obsolete. When it comes down to, like, if you want to sound on bluegrass like Red Smiley did on Backup Bluegrass, this isn't it. It's a different sound. This is very good. This is better for lead bluegrass than it is for backup, for just that rhythm, first position, rhythm chords, and the alternating basses. And, the uh, Martin does a great job on that. Martin and Gibson make great guitars. They do just fine for what they do, but there there are some places they don't go. This is very versatile. It does a wide variety of sounds that you wouldn't normally do on a standard flat top guitar. So you may say that looks like a flat top guitar. The mechanism by which it produces sound structurally, this has remarkably little resemblance to a Martin or Gibson flat top. This is its own beast. And just the vibration patterns, what it does, and structurally how it's put together is quite different. It is a new species. Yeah. It's a new genus even. You know, I tend to think in zoological terms. My academic background is in zoology. Yeah. And I've collected snakes since I was eight years old. I was subscribing to Copia, the Journal of the American Society of Ichthyologists and Herpetologists, when I was 12. And my undergraduate work in animal behavior studies was University of Chicago. And one of my specialties was feeding behavior of pit vipers. I had lots of them back then. I don't recommend those as good family pets. <laughs> Take a rattlesnake or a cottonmouth or a copperhead and one day and work with it for a few hours, showing it that I was a good guy. I could have them crawling up and down my arm. They would bite me. But I don't recommend you try that. And I don't do that anymore either because I don't know anybody who got away with that 10 years in a row without an accident. And after you've seen an accident with one of them, it was your appetite for doing that. So I have 25 snakes in my office. They're all harmless. So they won't hurt anybody. And most of them are even friendly enough and hand them to a kindergarten kid. And kids come in to visit them and I can take friendly snakes out and let them play, and it's totally safe. Yeah. But I would never hand a kid a snake that would bite. But I know which ones I can do that with and which ones I wouldn't hand you. But, um, but the point is, I use, in many ways, the same methodology looking at guitars that a zoological taxonomist would to figure out what it is. And my father was a pathologist. I saw my first autopsy before I was 10 years old. And the same methodology, forensic pathology, is exactly the same methodology as looking at guitars and also understanding their anatomy, what makes them work, what makes them not work, what kind of geriatric problems they may have, what things you wish could be better designed like teeth. They don't self-repair. Well, if I see problems with guitars, when I'm designing a guitar, I like to fix things. So I don't simply blindly copy old. 
what's good and old, I'm interested in. What's maybe new and interesting, I also want, because I have the ability here to sort of be the creator. And I don't have to follow only existing designs. However, just being different for the sake of different, you know, sometimes people have done things and the designs have evolved over time. They've learned a lot. You know, a company like Martin has been in business since 1833. They've done a lot of learning along the way. Don't throw the baby out of the bathwater. And there are ideas there that you can learn a great deal from discussing and examining the golden age instruments, listening to them. You might figure out ways to tweak where they're stronger in some areas, or you know, we wouldn't put a pick guard glued directly to the wood that we made out of nitrous cellulose and it shrinks and glue it with firm hard glue that then ends up cracking the tops. So we don't do that. But there's a whole lot of things to be learned from vintage instruments that you don't always have to reinvent the wheel. There are some things that the vintage instruments do that you definitely want to understand and utilize everything that's good about it. And so new is not necessarily always better. So new technology has some interesting advantages, but I want to combine old with newest ideas and do it in such a way that it's highly functional and does something new and interesting and useful. Because simply being different alone, different is not necessarily better, not necessarily as good. It has to be interesting, versatile, and really useful. So, and affordable. Yeah, because you nailed that. I mean, if working conditions and serious amateurs can't afford it, then I'm not interested. You know, there are some makers whose prices start at $50,000. And even if they sound really good, there's nobody using one on stage or in the studio. Sure. They get relegated to display cases and it's, art. Uh, it might be fine to display it, but if you're not going to actually play it or use it, and if it's not within the reach of players to afford and use it, then it's not doing what it, the instrument is really supposedly intended to do. It's supposed to produce music. But it's also supposed to be inspirational to play. A good instrument feels alive. It feels responsive. But it's not simply a slave that can do only what you tell it. It can make suggestions. It can have soul and personality. It can change what you do and make suggestions you might not have thought of otherwise. And earlier I mentioned Bill Monroe. Bill Monroe was playing things on the F5 that he had never heard before, but he heard it in that mandolin and it responded. And there was sort of a partnership there. And there's a lot of instruments like that. You know, Charlie Christian played music that the designer of the guitar never thought of. And a lot of the instruments today are used for music. The the originators of the instruments never conceived of. Leo Fender didn't envision James Burton or Steve B you know, Buchanan. Uh, you know, you know, Buchanan did stuff and Burton did stuff. Hendrix did stuff. These were sounds that Leo never thought of. Yeah. His old Fender guitars went out with heavy flat wound strings. He couldn't bend notes much. The Les Pauls were sent out with heavy flat wounds. Les Paul didn't bend notes much. Les Paul didn't play rock. He didn't play R&B. But the people who actually 
most used the Les Paul. Many of them don't even know who Les Paul was. Uh, they certainly don't know much about his style of music, but it's used for a lot of stuff that Les never dreamed of and Les probably wouldn't have even liked. I don't think Les would have appreciated Billy Gibbons. But the um, point is, they're versatile enough to do things, and sometimes it's set up completely differently. Les Paul with seven gauge first, like Billy does, that responds way, way different than the way they went out from the factory back in the 50s. But many of the instruments, bluegrass didn't exist when the F5 was made. It was designed for classical music, but it came out too late for classical. It came out in 1922 and the classical movement was dying and bluegrass didn't exist until 1945. It was a commercial failure when it was new. Actually, in Gibson, you know, the Flying V and the Explorer were also commercial failures when new because they were too modernistic for the day. Now it's great, but the F5 came in too early for bluegrass, and too late for classical. But now people know, wow, they're great. But an awful lot of these guitars and banjos and mandolins are used for music that didn't exist. At the time that the designer conceived of them and are used for music that the designers and the manufacturers simply were not anticipating, but that the instruments were versatile enough to do a wide variety of different styles and to really inspire people to do that. So there's this pairing of the musician and the instrument. Because if the instrument is soulless, makes no suggestions, or isn't very responsive, you might not come up with some of those new sounds. It's not a matter of how expensive the instrument is. There's some great music. A lot of the great blues was composed on pretty inexpensive instruments, but the player found something that they did well. And sometimes the instrument may not be versatile, but there's some particular sound it's got that, wow, you come up with a whole new genre of music. And, uh, yeah, but those black blues players who came out with some of the greatest blues ever were not the target audience of the manufacturers because the manufacturers like to find people who will actually pay money to buy one. And so, therefore, it helps to have a clientele that can afford to buy them. As some of the instruments, it's like a lot of country banjo players bought secondhand banjos after the Dixieland movement died, or after the classic banjo era died. Uh, those had five string banjo played with gut string makers like Fairbanks and Vega, early Bacons. A lot of those were five string, but later they were discovered by bluegrass and country players. And Les Pauls from the 50s today are wonderful guitars, but they're not played for the music that the Ted McCarty or Les Paul had in mind. Yeah. It's, it's okay. Leo Fender didn't envision a lot of what he would have created either. But these are versatile. And Martins and Gibsons and those flat top acoustics and their arch tops also have proven to be remarkably versatile. Their electric instruments certainly have. But if you just look at the old catalogs and see who was endorsing and how they were dressed and what kind of music they played, it's a whole different scene now. But yeah. there's room for a lot of creativity. And these inspire me. Don't, don't, don't you think being in Nashville and, you know, I know Nashville's changed a lot, but being around so many great recording studios and session players and, and hearing them talk, I'm sure a lot of recording studios in Nashville still have a Tacoma papoose hanging on the wall that gets used more than the $10,000 guitars that are sitting next to it. Don't you think that's been kind of like, uh, I'm, I'm sure that's encouraged you through this process, hearing from these working musicians that like they are looking for new sounds. Well, 
you know, music does not exist in a vacuum. And designing and uh, creating anything new helps to be in a creative environment. Nashville is. Uh, in some ways, we could say that Paris of the 1880s through the very early 1900s had this wonderful explosion of all kinds of creative art. And uh, you see centers where there were a bunch of writers, sculptors, painters, musicians. And uh, Nashville is a hot spot for that. Uh, you know, New Orleans had its music scene. Kansas City had a great jazz scene. Chicago has a great R&B scene. But Nashville is one of the most versatile, diversified music scenes anywhere. I think that there's fewer people here than in Manhattan or the New York City area, but so far as creative diversity musically, Nashville has been very, very prominent. And uh, some of those areas have declined in their influence and Nashville has endured. Nashville remains one of the great creative centers anywhere in the world for musical diversity and creativity. But uh, there's always room for more. <laughs> And, um, you know, I've thrived pretty well in this setting here, but I'm not claiming that it's always been an easy ride. It's been a lot of bumps and there's been times when it's been a roller coaster ride and um, I'm having fun. But so far as it, it, there's still challenges, there's always challenges but you know adversity is the mother of invention and if you're completely complacent you think everything is perfect then you don't create much that's new so i'm always looking for more yeah uh has it been hard to find staffing for your guitar factory surprisingly not okay that's great people want to work there yeah We've had more applicants than we can hire. Incredible. Incredible. And, and how we've been talking about these brand new guitars, but but how are you seeing the, the vintage market right now, if you want to make a generalization or two? Pristine, fine, collectible instruments are doing extremely well. Utility grade used instruments, in many cases, are not as good in quality or even in bang for buck for what they can do as many that are brand new. And as a result, we're selling right now, if you just look at the number of instruments we sell on a daily basis, we're selling more new instruments than used ones. Really? But the dollar volume of new versus used is still such that you know, you sell $100,000 guitar, ooh, that's, you have to sell 100 $1,000 guitars <laughs> to equal that one sale. Yeah. Uh, dollar volume is still plenty productive for me to have vintage instruments, plus I love vintage instruments. That is a great passion. Do I have a deep passion for student model new guitars? The answer is no, I don't. And we don't carry much of that. But we do have guitars of quality. And some of those quality guitars don't have to be unaffordable. If Martin's making some very, very fine guitars that in the range of $2,500 to $4,000, you can get a guitar brand new that plays and sounds better than almost any instrument in that same bracket, price bracket used will. Their new ones are better than what they made 20, 30, 40, or 50 years ago. And in many cases, some of the brand new Martins are better than they made even in the 1960s or even into the 50s. So 
there are new guitars that are affordable. I'm not saying cheap, cheap, but you know, at the range of twenty five hundred to five thousand dollars. There's some absolutely, really, really fun, fine instruments that, in many cases, new ones are beating used ones that are in that price bracket. But in the true golden era vintage, they are still collectible and for good reason. But are these as much fun to play as some of my true golden era instruments? The answer is, in my opinion, yes, they are. So I do like playing these right on up there with some of the instruments I have that are worth $100,000 or more. And that was my goal, was to make a guitar that was affordable, that would be every bit as much fun to play as those golden era vintage instruments and could also do things that some of those old ones can't do. That's a pretty bold statement, but the only way you can really find out how true it is is to come in and try one. You don't have to buy it, but you can come in and try it and see for yourself what they do, or you can buy one and discover how much fun it really is. Yeah. I, I know some people are going to be listening to this and going, man, this guy's just trying to sell new guitars. But I also have the knowledge that, you know, you've always been very matter of fact about instruments. If a guitar, an, like a vintage guitar on your website says a fine sounding guitar, that is like hyperbole almost. That is you really giving it uh, an endorsement because you've seen so many guitars and you don't throw praise around faintly. And, and so... To hear you so enthusiastic about these guitars is is really interesting. They are interesting. <laughs> and they do inspire me. I love it. Uh, do, is there a I'm secret sauce? I really like that I hadn't even anticipated. Mm -hmm. They're a lot of fun. You talked about the body. You talked a little bit about the bracing. Uh, the next, aside from the the headstock and the the cutaway or the um, the heel, did you model these after a, an existing guitar's neck that you particularly loved? Is this a whole new neck shape and feel design? It's not a dramatically different neck feel. It's very similar to some of the Martin necks of the early 1900s, a soft V. But if you want a C shape, no problem. Uh, if you want a D shape, I don't know why you'd want that. But <laughs> C shapes and variations of V shapes are good. But so far as how thick the neck is, now people do have different preferences there. Yeah, yeah. So um, I've had very few complaints about the neck, uh, but there's a few people who would prefer a narrower nut. These are one and three quarters. If not narrower, we can do it. Um, but um, the one and three quarters, if the neck contour is good, is very comfortable. It makes a huge difference what the cross section contour of the neck is and the depth as to how it feels. So it's not simply a matter of how wide it is. Uh, these conform well to the anatomy of the average human hand. But somebody who's seven feet tall and his basketball player may want a different neck dimension than somebody who's five foot two. And we can work to accommodate that. Well, and you, and you mentioned the ease of swapping necks without doing any damage. This also makes for probably a great travel guitar. You could just take the neck off and put it in your carry on, right? Well, you could. Yeah. Yeah. It's easy enough to do. Yeah. But in general, most of these fit in the upper, in the uh, overhead anyway. Depends on what airline you're traveling on. But if you're going on Southwest, I've never had any trouble taking a guitar and putting it in the overhead bin, as long as you get in the A boarding section. Yeah, as long as you get there early. <laughs> well, no, you can actually pay like 10, 10 or $15 extra and you get in the A section. Okay. And then you're assured you'll be in with ample time to... Get mm -hmm. up, uh, you know, the overhead bin space. 
but uh, these are not huge guitars. They're 15 inches wide, they're four inches deep, and they put out more volume than most standard size bigger guitars. They are loud, but they're capable of dynamic range, soft, medium, or loud. But when I'm listening for tone, you know, people talk about how tone is just purely subjective, but you can listen for five things or more uh, very objectively and measurably. I'm looking for balance of volume from string to string with equal pressure picking. I want it to be about the same volume from one string to another and up and down. So it still will change tonality depending on where you pick it. I'm looking for balance of sustain. If you do a six note chord, do some notes fizzle out quicker than others? If they do, it's not completely balanced in that respect. I'm looking for balance of dynamic range. I want for you to be able to play it soft, medium, or loud without undue distortion or overdriving it. There's a lot of guitars, you hit them too hard, it's just like a recording where the needle goes into the red and it just distorts and it's not a usable note. I want these, you can play them ridiculously loud and they still work. I'm looking for balance of harmonic complexity. Every note is a fundamental note, and above it and below it, there are harmonics. That's what gives the tone character. That's why you can play a viola and a violin, three of the four strings, at the same tuning. But if you play a passage using just those three strings, you can still tell the viola from the violin. The harmonics are different, the tonal character is different, or oboe versus a clarinet, they're at the same pitch exactly. You can play the exact same piece of sheet music, and you can tell right away which is the oboe versus the clarinet. Um, and the last thing I'm looking for is balance of clarity of articulation. Some notes can be thumpy and fuzzy, and some may be crystal clear, and a lot of finger papers like a thumpy bass and clear trebles, but I'm not aiming for that. I want it to be clear all the way. If you want thumpy bass, you've got the palm of your hand here can provide thump. You can damp a string. But if you have thumpy notes, no matter what you do, if it's open, you can't, you can't clean it up. So I want clarity so that you can then you can manipulate the sound rather than be limited. Yeah. That's another reason why these are versatile. How many iterations of bracing? I mean, we talked about all these different woods you're even optioning. I, I'm guessing from the first prototype to today, you must have experimented with all sorts of variations on what's going on under the hood. Surprisingly little. Okay. <laughs> but uh, they're not identical to the Tacoma. And we have done some tweaking. But have we gone through literally dozens of iterations? No. Okay. But yeah, we've done uh, at least half a dozen. But um, but you're happy, obviously. Oh yeah, we're happy. Now for the big baritone, it will be it will have some additional bracing tweaking uh, from what we do on the standard guitar. But that's going to be about a, close to 18 inches wide and five deep and a 28 and a half scale. It's, but people who have played a prototype were highly impressed. So I, yes, it felt exactly right. It did exactly what they hoped for. And uh, no, they wouldn't have wanted it smaller because it wouldn't have done the same. It's just like a violin. You don't want a violin to be bigger or smaller. And as far as cellos, uh, they need to be that big. Um, but there's a, there's a certain optimum balance of air chamber to the amount of vibrating soundboard, size of sound hole. Small hole gives you a lower resonant frequency of the air chamber. Big hole gives you a higher pitch, so that gives you a fairly low pitch to this size chamber, plus you have a big sound vibrating area, which also enhances bass and power, but it still gives you a great treble. So it's not 
it's balanced. It's not bass heavy. It's not treble heavy. It has power throughout, including all the way to the 22nd fret. Incredible. George, thank you. This was so insightful. And uh, I'm sure I'll get a million questions from people listening to this and we'll have to do a follow-up at some point. And I need to come to Nashville and see these things, but uh, congratulations. They are fun. <laughs> more coming. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And uh, and maybe coming to some, some select stores around the country. That will probably be in the reasonably near future, yes. Okay. All right. George, thanks as always. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. All right. That was my conversation with George Groon. I have interviewed him and talked to him many times over the last 15, 18 years, and I've never heard him quite so ecstatic or happy. Kudos to you, George. You've cracked the code. You figured it out. I love that you are having a blast making these guitars, and I cannot wait to try one out myself. And if you are enjoying our podcast, stay tuned. We've got TJ Thompson and Mark Stepman coming up very soon. We've also got an interview with Adam Levy dropping next week. Best way to get all the shows is just to hit the subscribe button on the podcast player of your choice. And last but not least, if you'd really love this show enough to the way you've made it this far, we have a Patreon for this show, and I would love your support. There'll be a link in the show notes where you can get some bonus content. You can see the video from this interview we just did and a lot more. 